Do you ever feel like hundreds of people are talking to you with hundreds of words all at the same time every day? <laughs> oh, maybe you do feel like that. If you don't, you should, because that's exactly what's happening. They say that in the 1970s, the average person was exposed to about 500 advertising messages a day in the 1970s. By 2007, that was 10x, 5,000 messages a day. And now in 2021, what's the last study I saw, 10,000, on average, 10,000 advertisements coming at us every day. Add to that the over 180 notifications, text messages, and emails that the average person gets in 80, some of you are much higher than that number. And what we find is that we are surrounded and hounded by hundreds and hundreds of messages that are inviting us and demanding that we respond. Of course, advertisers, I mean, that's why they're sending you the messages is they want you to respond in some way. Click, scan, sign up, text this number, buy, whatever. It's, it's the whole point of the advertisement. It's trying to elicit a response or reaction from you. The sooner, the better. <laughs> but not just, you know, big corporations, right? Your friends, your family, your workplace, your teams, whatever. They're texting you saying, hey, where are you? Email. How can we have, I sometimes get texts from my, from my kids, blah, 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 blah. Then just dad and then question mark, question mark, question mark. How come you haven't responded, right? Because we live in an age where technology has not only allowed us to send more messages, but has given us the opportunity to respond more quickly to those messages immediately. So we are surrounded and hounded by all these messages that are inviting us to respond and it's easier than ever to react and respond. Now, quick response, quick reaction time may be really good if you're trying to win some quizzes at church or contests, <laughs> but it's bad for relationships, right? The quick response, the quick reaction is generally not good for relationships. I mean, we've all been there. We've all been there where, you know, one of my favorite artists says it like this, the words came out like a landslide. <laughs> what you can't take back keeps you up at night, right? We've all said things in a way or the tone, whatever that was regrettable, that we wish we could take back, that, you know, hurt the other person or was a quick response, quick reaction, a quick text, a quick post, words coming out fast. <laughs> That, that we can't take back. We wish we could take them off the other person's screen or we wish they couldn't have screenshotted that thing or we wish that, and even if it wasn't in print, it got imprinted, right? We, we don't forget words. And even if we didn't say them out loud, sometimes we're like, you ever had that thing where you're like, oh, I should have said that or I could have said this. Usually it's a good thing you didn't, <laughs> right? But we play that back in our heads as like the responses we would have done or we would have said or we're having this imaginary conversation and all of a sudden it comes up again and now the words come flying out. And it comes out harder and stronger and harsher and more regrettable than we wanted or than we thought. The truth is, you know this, words have power. They do damage. Writers of the Bible say it like this, um, the, the, the tongue has the power of life and death. Or a tongue is like a rudder that can steer, this small thing that can steer a whole ship this way or that. We've all experienced that, how one word, one tone, one phrase, one conversation can send something down such a wrong path or start the tumbling of a, inter, a bad interaction. Or one writer says that the, the tongue or the mouth is our words are like a spark that can set a whole forest on fire. Words have power to destroy and to do damage, and we've all been on either side of that equation. And it's not that, um, it, that this is new, but technology has surrounded us with more words inviting us to respond and give us the ability to respond and react more quickly than ever. And so we're talking a little bit about that in this series called Two Ears, One Mouth, The Anatomy of Healthy Conversation, because we're realizing, man, we in our interpersonal relationships, and as a faith community in the world, in the world around us, in, in the way systems and groups of people interact, are more often than not unhealthy, full of conflict, full of fighting, full of bitterness, words and interactions that don't produce something healthy, but rather things that are unhealthy, that are divisive, conflicted, that fall apart, that create bridges and chasms, or a few weeks ago we talked about things that get decayed or torn down by words. We're saying, man, we need to, in our interpersonal relationships and as a community for the world around us that is hurting and conflicted, learn how to do this better. 
we really need help. <laughs> Technology's made it harder than ever, and so we need help. Now, in many ways, we could just sort of stop here and say, well, yeah, like that's enough of a reminder. Yeah, I gotta watch that. Oh yeah, I gotta watch my words. And yeah, okay, maybe that's good. You can leave now. Don't. Because we need scriptures uh, to, to speak to us because God has wisdom for us in this. This isn't just about getting a little bit better. We need the wisdom of God to speak into our lives, to steer us and guide us and direct us into healthy conversation. And so we're gonna look at uh, a portion of a letter written um, by the brother of Jesus, James, who happened to be the leader of the first community of Jesus followers in Jerusalem, as he's writing to his community about some of these issues. And the verse we're going to look at, even if you've never read it before, you probably would have heard it and said, oh yeah, yeah, I know that. It's a pretty famous verse. But <laughs> this time I actually looked at the verse that came before it, and the verse after it, because I think it gives us a whole, uh, just a bigger picture on for us who are pressed um, to react and respond, how we can actually start to have healthier conversations, certainly in an age and stage in life when it's easier than ever to respond and react. So let's uh, listen to what James, which I always say this about James because it blows my mind every time I think about it. He was the pastor of the first community of Jesus followers <laughs> who said Jesus is Lord, and he was also Jesus' brother. Like if you can convince your brother that you are his Lord, <laughs> you're probably Lord, I'm just saying. Anyway, let's listen to what James had to say to us about this. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. James' words here to the first century church in Jerusalem and to us 2,000 years later, where we um, have the added challenge of living in the technological revolution, where more and more words are being thrown at us, more and more demand to respond quickly, to react quickly, and realizing that so often we react, something, it doesn't produce something good. He actually starts with an instruction, but in a place on a much bigger issue than just the tongue and just how we speak. <laughs> he says here, like, uh, he talks about how we as human beings, and this is so interesting because I've read verse 19 before, which we're going to get into, um, but as I looked uh, at the verse before it, which in some of your Bibles, there'll be a break between them, but when these were originally written and translated from, from the Greek and stuff, they, they didn't have all these chapter breaks and like titles and headings and stuff, and so it's so fascinating to uh, read what verse 18 says because I think it's the starting point. And he says, we are, or God chose to give us birth through the word of truth um, that we would be like a first fruits of people, which is just strange biblical language, right? But what he's saying is he's not talking about, hey, God chose to bring you into this earth biologically. I mean, he did. He did create us. But he's saying, no, you have um, actually, we as the community of Jesus followers are a new kind of creation or a new community. We're the first fruits. He means the start of something new, which is basically saying that you and I are a new kind of human meant to multiply a new way of being. He uses the birth analogy to say, just like human beings are, are biologically created and then procreate and multiply the human race, that's what happens, that's what we do. He says, now as Jesus followers, you are actually have a new birth, not a physical one, but a spiritual one, um, where you're, you have come alive from the inside and you are the first roots or you are the beginning of a whole new way to be human and you're meant to multiply, not biologically, but in a way of a new way of living, a new way of responding. He says, this is a new community. And actually the whole book of James talks a lot about how is this new community meant to live? What is this new way of being human we're meant to display? <laughs> And then he begins and he says, hey, this is really important, calls attention to it. And he says this, each of you should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. In your relationships with each other, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Maybe, that's the verse I meant that some of you may have heard before, even if you didn't know it was here or you didn't even know it was in the Bible. You're like, yeah, okay, that sounds 
right? I think I've heard that before. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. But what commentators note about this little phrase, um, these few words, is that he's actually talking about a chronology or an order of how things are supposed to go. First, be quick to listen, then slow to speak, then slow to get angry. He's talking about an, an order that the, the new human, the new way of being human is meant to follow this order, which is the opposite of the order we normally follow. Our default way or the way we were born into with our biological birth that nobody taught us, but we all just caught from the environment around us that we all know how to do. Our default way of being, which is, is opposite from the new way of being that he's prescribing here, Instead of being quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry, we do the opposite. Our default way is first, our old way of reacting is first to get angry, to get offended, to be defensive, to get amped up, to be indignant, to be hurt, and to be defensive. He said, that's what happens first. That's what, that's what we do quickly. We are quick to get hurt, quick to get angry, quick to get offended, quick to get amped up, quick to be wounded. And then he says, when that happens, inevitably, our words begin to follow. The words come after, the words come pouring out. Um, words of rebuttal or argument or indignation or criticism or explanation or reason. Well, here's why, and this is what I mean, and you're wrong, and I can't believe you said that, and how could they do that? We, our emotions respond first, like the train leaving the station, boom, that's the engine that drives. What follows after that is our words of response, of rebuttal, of argument, of vindictiveness, of revenge, of anger that come out, whether in tone or whatever our attitudes are. We talked last uh, a couple of weeks ago about how each of us has a little bit of a bent in the way that we might respond, but the angry emotions or the strong emotions lead first. They're the, 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 the engine of the train that goes. The words follow <laughs> and the caboose listening is trailing along behind, if at all. <laughs> the train leaves the station and listening is left behind. He says, this is our default way of responding. That's the order of how things normally go. Listening gets kind of left in the dust. And we've all had this experience in some way where it is easy to feel emotionally triggered or, in, or incited or um, ignited or sucked in or whatever. We read a post or we get a text from somebody or we read something in the news or something the president does or something the prime minister does or something our friend said or something our husband said or something our, our brother did or something our, um, our company did. And right away we, are, we respond emotionally. Our words come out either in our heads or to other people or on text or emails or on Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is that we do. <laughs> and listening gets left behind. This is our default. It's, it's human. It's, it's, it's common. <laughs> it's understandable. We all do it. But James says, this isn't, he goes on to say why this doesn't help. This isn't good. And he says it this way. He says, the problem is that human anger does not produce God's righteousness. That's the problem with this, that human anger, when we lead the way, when our emotional response leads the way and our words come after and listening gets left behind, it does not produce God's righteousness. He's kind of contrasting the default way of beginning that we are all kind of born into biologically and this new way that we're meant to as a whole new humanity actually walk in, to, walk in and model and display and multiply through our conversations. It's essentially, he's saying, this is about self-righteousness versus God's righteousness. Conversations that are fueled by and produced by and motivated by self-righteousness versus God's righteousness. Self-righteousness is, well, we kind of know intuitively what that means. I'm right. I have the right to be upset. I know what to say. I'm more educated. I can see this better than you. I'm not getting what I need or you've offended me and I'm feeling hurt. And so I need to say, or I need to have a right to say this, or I have to, he said, that, that's, there's the self-righteousness. Remember we talked about the very first message here, that self-interest or pride when it leads the way blocks love, blocks healthy conversation. So self-righteousness is our default way of responding. And the problem is that when we do, when we respond with the self and the words come after and listening is left behind, what gets produced by self-righteous conversation, by, by the self-righteous reactions um, is often like belittling others, right? Because we have to tear somebody else down or tear their arguments down or, um, 
or criticize them or have contempt for them in order for us to be right or prove that we're right or our opinion or our idea to stick or to stand. And so we end up belittling others um, or we end up doing damage and, and hurting uh, others or ourselves. And we don't often, it kind of prevents us finding creative solutions or prevents us from actually um, having better or healthy conversations that produce something good. The contrast, he says, is human anger, it doesn't allow for God's righteousness to be produced. What is God's righteousness? God's righteousness isn't God's right, you're wrong, God's smart, you're stupid, you'd never win an argument with God anyway, so why do you bother? That's not, that's not the righteousness of God. When the scriptures talk about God's righteousness, it means everything that is beautiful and pure and good and right and healthy and wholesome, like everything ultimately deep down that we want and need from our conversations, from our life. This is God's desire and God's plan for us. It's why he created us. It's why he formed this new humanity so that we could experience and live in and multiply his good, beautiful, whole ways of doing things, including how we talk. Self-righteousness versus God's righteousness. And that's why he uses that word produce. It goes back to this idea of something organic and that's beautiful and that grows, right? And the analogy over and over used in scripture, and I've mentioned it a couple times in this series, is like a tree. When a tree grows up healthy, when, when something like that is produced in good soil, the tree is strong and stable and the, it provides shelter and shade for people on hot days. It provides habitat for creatures and birds. It provides fruit and nourishment, um, oxygen for the world to breathe and everyone. Like that's the, and then that's the impl implication here is that human anger, when our emotional response leads the way, when that's the engine that drives the thing and the words come after and listening gets left behind, Nothing good and beautiful. God's beautiful, good plans and intentions for your relationships, for my relationships, for our friendships, for our world, for our politics, our um, conversations at the dinner table, our school dialogue, the things that God wants don't get produced when that's what leads the way. But instead, when we are quick to listen, when our first response is to listen, I mean, quite frankly, and our words come later, <laughs> we're less likely to say something stupid, offensive, regrettable, things that leave an imprint or things that we wish we had never posted or talked about or gossiped about or, you know, angrily responded. Like when we listen first, we're less likely to say things we regret. We're more likely to hear and value the other person. Remember we said a couple of weeks ago, this isn't about not saying anything. This is about being passive. It's about listening. There's an active component. This isn't just about sitting back and shutting my mouth, I better not say something bad. Well, that's true, it's helpful not to say something destructive first, but to actually to engage the ears, to close the mouth so the ears can be open. Because we have two of these and only one of these. So silence the mouth so that the ears can lead first. That the train leaving the station is listening. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. Our words, when they come after, they'll probably be better. There'll probably be less of them they'll probably be more productive and wise. Then our emotions can show up in a healthy and productive way. It's not that our emotions are bad. Um, there, in fact, many times we have reasons for feeling what we are feeling, the anger, the sadness, the frustration, the hurt, um, maybe a little bit of wounded pride, or maybe some of it's not healthy, but a lot of it, it can be. The problem is when it leads first and the words come after and listening is left behind, we don't have an opportunity for our emotions to actually help produce something good. That our emotions, when they come in a little bit later, after we have had time to pause, to stop speaking and start listening, to use words carefully, then our emotions can be brought in a healthy way into the conversation. That's what happens when we listen first. But maybe the most important aspect about being quick to listen is we make room for God. We make room for God to speak and God to work. Everybody say room, room. <laughs> when we are slow to speak and quick to listen, we leave room. We make room for God to speak. A couple weeks ago, we said it this way. Don't make an ask of yourself. <laughs> this isn't about self-righteousness, what you think, what you want, your ideas. Leave room for God to speak first. 
He has plans and ideas and wisdom to share with you for these conversations, for these complex issues, for these things that amp us up and rile us up and bait us into respond, response. Leave room. Don't react. Leave space not only to listen to the other person, but to listen to God and to give room for God to work in a situation. Sometimes we're quick to respond because we think, I need to control this. I need to fix this. I need to say something. If someone doesn't, then it's a problem, or this is a big deal, or this is something worth getting angry over. Even for the things that we say, these are justice issues. These are things we need to speak out about, and they may be, and they often are. But leaving room first for God to work. In fact, in Romans 12, the Apostle Paul says, hey, leave room for God's wrath, for God says it's his job to get angry and his job to avenge not ours. We are not the vigilantes of justice using our words to smash people and smash things and tear things down. We are meant to leave room for God to do that. And when we create space, it shows that we trust God, that he can speak and that he can work. When I'm reacting quickly, when I feel the need to respond, to post, to text, to, to verbally respond, to get involved with my words, I'm not trusting God. I'm not trusting God that he has something to say to me first, that he has something maybe to say to the other person that I don't even need to say it because God can speak. He has stuff to do. He's trying to work or wants to work and that I can get in the way that my words, James says, don't produce what God is trying to do. <laughs> so get out of the way and let God work. <laughs> it's interesting, right? If you look at the life of Jesus, you know, Jesus is called the, we were called, James says here, you're the first fruits, this new humanity. Jesus is called the firstborn of the first fruits. In other words, the oldest son in a new family, and we are all the sons and daughters of God, the, the, the siblings that come after, but he is the firstborn, as in the prototype. And Jesus, the prototype, when he came to earth, he was silent for 30 years. Right? Do you, ever, do you ever think about that? Like that basically 90% of his life or more, he, he, his words, I mean, I know he spoke, but obviously nothing too profound because nobody wrote it down. It was really the three years. But the, for the first 30 years, the son of God who was sent into the world to fix it, to save it, redeem it, rescue it, heal it, said nothing. The silence of God, even in the first 30 years of his life on earth. And then when, and then, and it says actually one of the, the gospel writers says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places. He was often by himself. He often left when the disciples wanted him to speak and act. He was by himself. He was often silent. Sometimes people would talk to him and he wouldn't say anything. He'd draw in the sand or he'd just ignore what they were saying altogether. Or they'd, they'd ask him a question and try to bait him to respond. And he'd ask them a question. He wouldn't respond. And when he did, his words were wise, profound powerful. When he was angry, because Jesus was not non-emotional, his emotions came. But when he was angry, said he was angry with the right person for the right things for the right amount of time. Jesus shows us being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. But here's the thing. This isn't just about, hey, Jesus did it. You should follow him. You should be like him. Yes, we're following him. But Jesus never intended that somehow in the moment, under pressure, when you and I are baited to respond, that somehow we would just respond with wisdom and silence and beauty and all this stuff. Like he, without, like he never expected to just be like him like that, without adopting his practices of silence, right? It's almost impossible to be silent when you're under pressure if you've never practiced silence when you're not under pressure. The practice of silence is actually something we're meant to learn and follow from Jesus. And so I want to do something right now. We've done this before uh, in our services, but maybe this is new to you, but we're going to do it in a bit of a new way. Back in the day, they used to have these silent films, which is really stunning to think about because now uh, apparently the new thing is to watch movies with subtitles. So the sound and the words. <laughs> well, what about movies when there was no words or sound? That's crazy. But I want to give you a chance to actually play back a silent film of your own life, just for a moment, I want you to think about um, a conversation, an interaction, a time uh, maybe recently or a little while ago when you reacted or responded quickly. And we're gonna kind of do an imagination exercise where we silently watch ourselves, where there's no sound, but we are kind of like being able to watch ourselves in that moment, in that interaction, just to observe what might have been going on to make room <laughs> for God to speak and for us to be quick to listen and slow to speak. And so that's what we're gonna do. So I want you to, and it might help you, help you to do this uh, if you want to. 
to just close your eyes. And, and Jesus can help you with this in your mind, but just to bring to mind uh, a conversation, an interaction. Maybe it was live, it was in person. Maybe it was via text or via email or something you read that then you responded to in some kind of post or reaction. Why don't you just think about that one, one of those instances for a moment. God can bring something to mind for you. Um, maybe it's something that, probably something that didn't go well <laughs> when, you, when you reacted, whether it was in person or over a device or whatever. And uh, if nothing's coming to mind, you can just enjoy the silence. That's good. And as you're um, listening there and you're seeing yourself in kind of this silent film, what do you notice now that you can step back and observe it a little bit? What do you notice about yourself, your body language, your tone? Maybe you're noticing what happened before <laughs> right before you got into this interaction or conversation. What do you notice about the other person? Maybe if they're there live in the room, their body language, their tone, what was going on around them, or if it was something you read, what do you think? might have been going on with them, their tone, their experience, their world. Why did they choose the words they chose? Just observe. And then in this place of silence, <laughs> we're making room for God to speak. And so now you can just ask Jesus, what do you see? What did I miss? Jesus, what do you observe? What's important for me to see now? Friends, this practice of silence is not for silence sake. <laughs> it is to allow ourselves to observe and think and reflect and give room for God to speak and to work. I was thinking about it like this when you read the passage like this. Silence is like the safety on a gun. <laughs> I have a friend who used to be a pastor and now he's a police officer and he said in his training and now he's been in the force a couple years now, um, when you unholster your gun, any, as soon as you take it out, you know you're gonna have to write a report, right? Like if you just, if, if your gun comes out in a interaction or whatever, or it comes out of your holster, you're gonna have to write a report. You have to give an account. Why? Because it's a weapon. It can do damage. And I was thinking, man, Silence is important because our words can do damage too. Our words can be weapons. <laughs> it's basically saying we should be very careful whenever we speak. Because words matter. Words are important. And silence can be this beautiful gift to help us be careful before we use them. want to give you a couple of practical, hopefully really practical tips on, on how we could live this out as a new humanity, <laughs> as a new community, how we could multiply this kind of way of seeing the world so that the world slowly gets changed and transformed 
by this new order, this new progression, this new chronology of how we do conversations, especially difficult ones. One is just to practice silence more often, it, it, like on a daily basis, in your car, when you're walking to school or home from school, in the morning or in the evening. And by silence, I mean silence, not music. Like music's fine, I love music, whatever, but there are times where there's needs to, it just needs to all stop to be silent in order to reflect. Oh, what just happened there? Where am I at today? What am I feeling? How am I entering this space? How was I in that space? To kind of have a, you know, play the silent film back a little bit. Or just to give room for God to speak. Silence is something we can regularly practice. If you've never done it before, like going to the gym, whatever, don't try to bench press 200. Like start with a minute of silence or maybe three minutes or five minutes. Maybe you work your way up to 30 minutes. Um, drive time's good for that too. Secondly, try silencing the messages for a period of time. And by that, I mean like your phone, your device, television, computer. Um, maybe make a pact with a friend or a spouse or a family member or whatever. And if you've never done that before, like try, okay, can I go an hour without the messages coming in, without seeing or hearing any of that stuff? Okay, if you've done an hour, maybe do three hours, maybe do a half day, maybe a full day. Um, Sunday's a good day to do that. It's the day we normally gather for weekly worship to, to spend, to, to try to carve out an hour or three hours or a half the day, you know, before you get to the weekly worship gathering. Say, okay, no devices, no TV, no messages. Just want to turn down the noise that are, that's always baiting me to respond. So maybe that's a pact. You can do it with someone else and say, let's do this. Let's try this together. Some of you uh, in high school or junior high, your friends, you Snapchat with each other, whatever. Make a pact. Try to do it. See what happens. And then can we just get practical here? Like, okay, so in the moment, right? So that's about practicing when you're not under pressure, right? So that practicing when you're not under pressure, silence, actually helps you be silent when you are under pressure. So what about when you are under pressure? In the moment when you're pressed to respond. Here's a couple of really practical things. As much as you can, ask a question first. Just try. Try to first ask a question before you respond. And don't, like, like I said last week, oh, why'd you, why'd you react like that? Or what's the matter with you? Or why is that such a big deal? That's not a question. <laughs> That's sort of a rhetorical statement. Legitimately ask a question because you're curious. Before you speak, first, like asking a question, a good one, is actually a way of listening. Tell me more. I want to listen. I don't think I understand. I'm not going to assume I understand. Tell me more. Ask a question. Secondly, ask yourself, do I really need to respond right now? Like, does this have to be, I know we're baited. We're always invited to respond right away. And this other person can be saying, you have to, you have to, you have to respond now. But do I really need to respond right now? And maybe if the other person has said something to you, texted something to you, posted something, shared something with you, that's really important, say, thank you for sharing this is really important. Can I take some time before I respond? Right? Like you're acknowledging what they said. You're not, you're not silent in the sense of like close off. You're, you're saying, thank you for sharing. This is really important. Can I take some time? Maybe you're in a meeting. I had a friend, who, a business guy. He says, you know what? When in under pressure or whatever, um, I'll say, guys, this is too important right now. I haven't had time to pray about it. I can't make a decision yet. I'll get back to you in 15 minutes. I'll get back to you in a half an hour. I'll get back to you tomorrow. Ask for time and space. A friend shares something with you. A friend says, what do you think about this? Or a friend says, hey, why did you do this? Or I'm feeling this. You can say, thank you. Thank you for sharing. This is really important. It's important to me. Can I take a bit of time to respond? Can you give me a half hour? Can we talk tomorrow? Can we meet this weekend? You know, as I was praying for us as a church, I just thought, oh, man, when, when James is saying, hey, God chose to give you life, you're a new creation, first fruits, new kind of humanity. I just felt like he was saying to us, you don't have to live in the old pattern anymore. You don't have to keep repeating the same patterns of the emotions, the train driving first, the words coming after and listening get left behind and it produces not a lot of uh, goodness, righteousness in our conversations. We don't have to live like that anymore. For some of you, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're realizing, hey, this is so much bigger than just my conversations. I need to be made alive. When he says that, yeah, like I want to be a new person. Like I've realized that about me. This isn't just a few uh, tips and tricks that I can employ. I need to be a new person. I need a new heart, a new mind, a new way of responding. I don't want, I'm done with the old way. If that's you, please talk to one of the site pastors. Talk to me. This is what it means to become a follower of Jesus. It says, the, the scripture tells that anyone is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone the new has come.
That is what we get, new life in Jesus. And so for some of you, that starting point is right there. Forget just the conversation. Become a new person. This is what Jesus offers us. And for those of you that already say, I'm a new creation in Christ, can I just say to you, if you are tired and frustrated with the rut of the old way, of how the default of how you're responding or the people and the, or the patterns, the unhealthy habits in your friendships, in your marriage, in your family, at your workplace, that God can and wants to do something new.